Hello, and welcome back to the Vancouver Life Real Estate Podcast. Today is September the 8th, and we are discussing the August 2020 real estate stats. Uh, As usual, they are amazing. (laughs) And by amazing, I mean just amazingly interesting. Yeah. There's a lot of surprises today, a lot of surprises for, I think, for anyone who would have forecasted what real estate could have possibly done uh, during a pandemic and a recession. Um, Quick note here, um, we are doing this as a podcast. We are doing this as a YouTube video. And of course, we have the TVL report, which is a downloadable PDF. Mm -hmm. So no matter how you like to consume this content, we have you covered thevancouverlife.com for all your data needs. That's where you get it. So Ryan, um, top level, what happened last month in Vancouver real estate? Yeah, well, I think the the headline is certainly going to be, um, you know, August hits a five-year record high, right? And um, a five-year high in what? Sorry, <laughs> in, in volume. In volume, yes. all right, for the month of August. That's right, yes. And uh, so... What does that mean, right? What if we if we take a, a high level look at that? Um, well, if we look at uh, August of 2019, which was probably the last typical August we had, um, August is typically a very slow month. It's not a very busy month, um, and as a result, um, you know, year over year, we've seen growth of about 36.6 percent which is a tremendous growth year over year. Um, still wasn't quite as busy as uh, July uh, versus July year over year as, as sales decreased just marginally by about two and a half percent. You know, so still maintaining a very, very consistent level. Um, but really the other, the other big story is um, we're about, you know, we're about 20% above the 10 year August sales average. And um, I couldn't have, predicted that. <laughs> yeah, nobody could have, I, I think. Sure, we thought, saw things slow down, uh, understandably, in, in, in April and May. And I guess, apparently, there was some pent-up demand. But again, what we're just seeing is it's sort of the great, I guess, shuffling of, of moving around, right? We're not seeing, obviously, new people coming into the country to buy. No. But we are seeing people reestablish sort of what they want out of their 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 habitation and where they live. Do we call it like the great repurposing? (laughs) Potentially. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) it's, uh, people now have a whole new sort of life in in front of them in some senses, right. As opposed to, as we've touched on before, do I need to live downtown so I can walk to work? Yeah. Or any kind of, you know, really condensed living at this point, you know, is, is a a lot of what we're doing going to go back to, uh, um, you know, single family townhomes, a bit more space. Uh, it's decentralizing if you will. Mm -hmm. Right. That's it. Are we ready? Should we dig right into this? Yeah, I think the only last thing I want to say, um, as I pick my nose on the camera, <laughs> um, is that uh, you know when you actually look at year over year growth, respectively, um, let's just touch on the fact that you know whether you're looking at it as a recovery or as a bounce back, six and a half percent is what we've seen in typical growth year over year. Mm-hmm. Right. In, in terms of price points. So that's worth talking about as well. I mean, that's over half a percent per month on average. Yeah. In a pandemic. I just, we have yeah. to like hashtag yeah, everything with that right now. <laughs> you almost have to reiterate it so much just to believe that it's real. Well, yeah. And, and, you know, when you, you know, our last TVL report, we talked a lot about um, the repurposing of real estate as well. Um, but I think August has just emphasized that again, you know, it's, we're, we're seeing, you know, whether it's the great repurposing or an exodus out of, out of downtown, um, you know, you look at townhomes, you look at duplexes, you look at single family, they're on fire right Mm now on fire. And you look at condos and what was that scary number you told me the other day about how many were listed? In in the entire downtown core, so we're including, you know, Cole Harbor, downtown, West End, there, for the first time in six years, there's over 1,000 condos actively listed in the marketplace. Yeah. Um, Not great. Not not great. Yeah. Not great news if you're a seller. Um, But honestly, um, if you're a buyer, this could be pretty interesting. Mm Especially because I think that we're we're maybe just at the at the start of this uh, when it comes to condos. Anyhow, about maybe uh, even further price adjustment here. Right. So we always like to jump in and do sort of GVRD first as a whole, and then we kind of get more uh, specific into Vancouver East and West and each property type. So starting off here, let's just jump into uh, the GVRD. So the average property price, the big headline right here, is of course it went up again in price for the second straight month, you know, things started to kind of level off and even take a small dip Mm -hmm. uh, during, I believe it was the month of May. Um, 
Or was that bit. June? Small but bit. then, yeah, July and August jumped back Just, up. Yeah. Yeah. So we, more of like a shot out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair. We, uh, okay. So your average home price in GVRD, $1,038,700. And let's compare that to August of 2019, because that's a staggering change, mm-hmm. right? We're looking, August was 986400 Yeah. Uh, it's a swing number of fifty two grand just to live in your house. $52,000. The average home is worth $52,000 more than it was one year ago today. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's just that's five point three percent increase. Yeah. That's that's tremendous, yeah. and you. Um, this is where it also gets interesting too, because you know uh, the activity level is is there with it, right? Mm-hmm. So, August we uh, of twenty nineteen we saw about just over twenty two hundred units sold, mm-hmm. um, whereas this year we're over three thousand. Yeah. Right, and that's a thirty six point six percent, like we talked about earlier, jump mm-hmm. in activity. And when you look at the activity chart, it's it was busy. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> yeah, we know 2019 was a slower month, so it is important to year. really make, sorry, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> felt like a month compared <laughs> to this year. Um, the big thing to note here, I think, is last month's sales were 20% above the 10-year August sales average. Yeah. That's that's really where it starts to become interesting because, yeah, sure, uh, 2019 uh, as a lower baseline for the year, but to be 20% above the 10-year average, average is, yeah. uh, it's, it's a very notable number. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, you, you got to wonder, is is that going to continue? Because, you know, it's funny, when everyone was looking for quote-unquote COVID deals, uh, it's gone the other way. It just... You know, unless you're looking for a condo, I think, um, which you might get a COVID deal in in the coming months. But, um, you know, at least as of last month, even prices for condos went up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. We'll touch on that as well. Mm -hmm. So newly listed, right? Everyone's Mm -hmm. looking at inventory right now, too. So we had uh, just over 5,800 homes listed last last month, excuse me, which is a massive jump. Yeah, it's huge. We're talking 55% jump over the 37 and 50 homes listed last August. Yeah. 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 I think that's good news right now because I think there's a lot of buyers out there that are currently looking for for detached homes, right? So, you know, is that going to help stabilize uh, some of the pricing uh, for, you know, maybe in the short run? for mm-hmm. a little bit, you know, um, but it's certainly staggering numbers compared to the year before. Well, this was, uh, when we're talking about up being above the 10 year average, right? We had, um, the last stat, which was 20% above the new listings, 35% yeah. above the 10 year yeah. average. Yeah. That's a so, massive number. Yeah. Again, that, you know, that'll, that'll mean there'll be a little bit more competition for sellers, um, with more supply coming on. I, I think, you know, we're September, what, 8th today. Um, you know, I, I definitely think that you're in the next two, three weeks here, we're going to see some, um, some increase in supply as well. I, I think it's still going to come. Yeah. You know, well, this is a big listing month. Well, look at the total inventory next, right? So we kind of hit a, a bottom in inventory cycle right around November of mm-hmm. last year, yep. uh, November, December. And um, since then, it's almost been a straight line up. Yep. We're, we're sitting at about 12,800 of total inventory. Mm-hmm. Um, year over year, though, that's yeah. that's actually down. Yeah. We're down 4% totally. from last year, which is a bit of a shock to have a massive jump. So we're really playing a bit of catch up, it appears. Um, yeah, I think, you know, much, you know, COVID pushed everything down, pushed it all down the line, mm-hmm. right? And I think that's what we're seeing right now. Yeah. Like we're really seeing September is going to be a big month because we couldn't, we didn't have March. That's right. Right. So I think our total inventory, 10 year average, we're sitting, you know, just within a few points yeah. of the 10 year average for inventory. So it's pretty much kind of an even in that sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, but of course, the trend is upwards, unquestionably. Yeah. And then we'll look at uh, the sales to active listing ratio. And this is obviously, this is the ratio where we determine whether you're in a buyer, seller's uh, or balanced market. Right. And uh, um, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting story because when you look at last year, and this year, we went from balanced to absolutely in a seller's market, right? I mean, we're right now at 23.8%. So um, what that means is for every 100 homes on the market, 23.8% are selling, mm-hmm. right? And that puts us in a comfortable seller's position. Yeah, that's all property types. Yeah, Detached, um, about 24%, mm-hmm. uh, 30% for townhomes. Yeah, leading the way. And just under 22 for condos. Yeah. So everything's in the seller's market. And again, if you can, if you look at the graph, which again, you can see in our YouTube channel here, mm-hmm. um, or the TVL report, 
you know, outside of the, the COVID dip there, it's been on a very strong upward trajectory ever since January of 2019. Yeah, it's been pretty strong. It's just like this bull is just raging through the uh, the sales to active listing ratio here. Totally. And, and, and that's also a function of, you know, people coming out of the woodworks after a big price correction over the last year and a half, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, those needs are, are, are still present, right? And um, it's, it's continuing. Mm-hmm. Nice. So that's GVRD as a whole. Mm -hmm. Let's dig a little deeper now, focus on the Vancouver West area. Yes, where your average price um, actually went up by a similar percentage, but a whole lot more dollars. (laughs) Yeah, we're going to start with the the detached market in Vancouver West. So some of the most expensive real estate in Canada, Mm -hmm. um, your average detached home on the West side now, $3,085,000. Yeah, that's a big number. That's a big number. And (laughs) uh, the interesting thing here too, like you said, Ryan, similar percentage points, we're up about five and a half percent in price. But that of course equates to about $163,000. Yep. The, one year the law of large numbers mm-hmm. and, and uh <laughs> again look at the price chart here right bottomed out somewhere around uh, august september of 2019 yeah steadily increasing since then yeah and well rapidly increasing in the latter half of the year too mm-hmm. um interesting thing to note here um we're at you know three million eighty four eighty five thousand ish the peak for Vancouver West Detached was back in July of 2017, and we're still about $600,000 underneath that peak price. Wow. So still, still some room to go. Still some room to go. Are you telling sure. me there's value at $3 million? <laughs> I'm telling you, well, <laughs> it's on an upward trend, and people have purchased at that price. So for some people, that's a baseline they won't sell below. Right. So, okay, so your average home in West Vancouver, uh, over $3 million, and in August of 2019, 60 of them sold. Um, whereas August of 2020, 91 sold. That's a big change. Oh, almost 52% <laughs> increase in sales. Yeah. And, and again, at $3 million price point average. Yeah, that's tremendous, right? Um, and then also when you look at the newly listed, so a lot more supply coming on here too because the market conditions are just much better for this asset class. So we're seeing 126 last year um, and 191 this year. So an increase of 65, which is again, a big number. Mm-hmm. You're almost identical to the year, year over year sales change of about 51.6%. Yep. Still, even with that massive jump, um, total inventory just under five, or sorry, yeah, just under 590 yep. compared to 700 last year. So yep. we're actually 19% lower in inventory than last year. So the price is likely going to continue its trajectory up just based on um, a high level look at mm-hmm. these numbers, right? Yeah. Um, you look at the sales to active ratio as well. Um, August 2019 was 8.6%, right? That is a full blown buyer's market. Mm-hmm. And now we're at 15.5%, climbing ever steadily towards that seller's market, right? Yeah. We're in a balanced one right now, but for how long? I'm not sure because the numbers keep moving up. Yeah, it's following that trajectory yeah, of big upwards. Time. Yeah. Okay, let's have a look at some uh, some townhomes. All right, we're still on Vancouver West here, and yep. the townhome average price one million one hundred sixty three thousand. Yep, uh, that's a a relative increase. Uh, again, it's on par with everything else we've been talking about about a four point three percent change year over year, um, up forty seven and a half thousand dollars. And again, a fun reference to the all time high, which happened for this type of home back in April of 2018, we were about 6% under the all time peak price. Mm-hmm. So it's coming. Mm-hmm. Um, also, this uh, asset class seems to be the most popular right now. Um, townhomes and, and duplexes is kind of like, you got to put a bracket in there as well. Um, this year, we're looking at 43 uh, townhomes that have sold in August. Uh, last year, it's compared to 36, which is an increase of roughly 20%. Um, our newly listed is up a whopping 110%. Wow. Wow. <laughs> this thing's more than doubled. Yeah. Yeah. And that's uh, a function of a much better marketplace. I, I also think there was some, um, some townhome projects that were being constructed during the last couple of years. And we're starting to see some of those units at the market as well. Nice. All right. So then inventory, um, inventory down. <laughs> 15%. Yeah. So, you know, 224 units came online compared to the 257 last year. Yeah. You're down almost 15% uh, wow. inventory year over year. So what happens when inventory drops? 
price goes up. Usually, yeah. yeah. And that's kind of emulating in the 19.2% sales ratio. So we're just under a seller's market, um, very similar to where it was last year at the same time, around 19.8%. Yeah, very consistent here. Um, I, I, you know, I just want to say before we before we keep going here, th- I really feel like, um, you know, the single family home for, for a lot of people is maybe too expensive, right? And you're going to see a lot of people finding compromise here, wanting to be out of condos, but maybe can't afford that house. Yeah, the townhome duplex market, I think is going to be a very strong market. Mm-hmm. Last one for Vancouver West is the condo. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, we're... We include downtown in Vancouver West here. So this is where predominantly most uh, sales happen. Yeah. The average condo price in Vancouver West, $799,400. That's right. Yeah. And that's up again, 5.7% um, over August of last year, which was about 756000 Right. So we have a swing here of $43,000 compared to last year. Yeah. So anyone who was thinking about shopping for a condo downtown, and maybe they decided not to, Mm -hmm. to buy that same condo today, you got to come up with another $43,000. That's right. Yeah. That's the swing. Yeah. And, and pretty, pretty impressive, I guess, for an asset class that is, uh, um, in a, in a bit of a fist fight with every other asset right now in Mm -hmm. in the marketplace. Right. So yeah, we, uh, we predict the the condos to likely soften based on inventory here. Condo prices will soften. Yeah. Um, so uh, homes sold in August of 2020, we are at 343 uh, versus the 314 of 2019. So uh, an increase of about 9.2%. Yeah. So new listings, very similar, 97.5% increase. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Check out this number, 877 newly listed condos compared to 444 last year. Yeah. Almost that, double. It's a staggering number. Yeah. It's a so, big, big number. So understandably, that's going to push your inventory up. Uh, we're 20% higher than last year with about 1,787 condos available. That's right. In so, Vancouver West. Yep. Yeah, and um, our sales to active ratio here, um, down 2.1% from this time last year, right? And that's kind of what we're what we're talking about here. Yeah, we're sitting at 19.2%, just under seller's market compared to where it was last year. Which was a seller's market, right? Okay, that was Vancouver West. Uh, Now we will swing over and look at the same property types in the Vancouver East market. All right, so let's start off with single family. Um, This time last year, your average single family detached property on the east side of Vancouver was 1.364 million, which has now risen by over 10%. To $1.5 million. Incredible yeah. change. This is definitely one of the most sought after areas and property types in all of GVRD. Yeah, so clearly. We're, we're seeing a lot of heat here. Um, the price trajectory, I mean, it started, it kind of hit the bottom of the cycle around the middle of 2019, right. and it's just been up ever yeah. since. In, in fact, actually, it's really interesting when you look at the price points during the COVID breakdown. They just flatlined. They didn't even go down. That's right. They just said, well, hold on a sec. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then carried on. Okay. All right. So what is driving the prices of detached homes in Vancouver East? Uh, well, um, certainly demand is there. Um, you look at August of 2019 with 73 sales. It pales in comparison to the 118 that were done um, mm-hmm. last month. Yeah. And even though, just like almost all other property types, people are selling, people are listing. So, you know, 77% increase in listings over last year, uh, about 135 more, bringing it to 264 listed last month. Yeah. Uh, Again, we're still very low in inventory. Yeah. I mean, when you look at the total inventory year over year, right? I mean, that's, we were 680 last year, we're 524 and dropping. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a decrease of 30%. And when we see those decrease numbers, uh, you know, price is already on the move as Mm -hmm. we've talked about. Right. But, um, you know, comfortably, and this is a, this is definitely, we're talking about, you know, when we say that August is typically a sleepy month, 2019 saw 10.7% as your sales to active ratio, which put it clearly in a buyer's market. We are at 22.5% right now. That's a change of 11.8% in so, activity. So think about that. You had a 62% increase in homes sold yeah. and a 30% reduction in inventory. Yeah. So obviously, price. That, that's it, right? It's just <laughs> natural that price is going to follow yeah, that stat. This is an asset class that people want, 
right? And and the behavior is all over the stats here. Mm-hmm. So townhomes now, maybe a detach isn't in the price bracket, but a townhome is on the radar. Your average townhome in Vancouver East, uh, $903,000 now. Yeah, and that's up 56000 from the year before at eight forty seven, dollars um, with a yearly increase of 65 or 6.7%, and climbing. So no surprise, increase in sales. You yeah. know, sound like a broken record here, <laughs> but uh, this is just what's happening across the market scheme. Yeah, and, and similar numbers too. I mean, we're looking at uh, 30% more sales, uh, 31 versus uh, 24 compared to uh, August 2019. Newly listed is a staggeringly new or or high number at 78.1%. So a lot of sellers right now recognizing that they're they're in a hot market and and putting or at least trying to put their place on the market to get a good number. Inventory is showing that. uh, I mean, it's a slow or a small number. It's 99 versus 88. So only a 12.5% change in inventory, which is going to be reflected in the price. Mm-hmm. But check out this one. Sales ratio, 31%. Yeah. like It's about bonk- the highest that we're going to you know, talk about today. Yeah, bonkers seller's market. But shockingly, it was 27 a year ago. Yeah. So it has been a hot, hot market for at least a year here. Yeah. And, and that's kind of interesting because if you think about that, if it was a popular you know asset class this time last year, you know now that um, we've repurposed, quote unquote, real estate, um, I think it's going to continue to go up, you know, um, just based on price point alone until the price gap between single family and, and townhome, uh, get a little closer. The value is right here in townhomes. Yeah. Townhome prices, uh, you know, we've kind of seen them, they peaked as well just after about April, 2018, but they've been a little bit more resilient. They didn't Mm -hmm. take as big of a hit and they've really kind of, uh, held strong you know and right now as we see they're on an uptick and i think that's due in part to price point and what you get right you get a little bit outdoor space you get covered parking you get two or three bedrooms maybe you get a rooftop patio you get a lot of that condo value with um the elements of single family living Mm -hmm. right so great segue into condos there uh average price vancouver east condo 608 Sorry, six hundred thousand eight hundred dollars. Right. So uh, it's still an increase uh, of about six point one percent, which is very respectable. Um, Thirty four thousand five hundred dollars is what your average condo has gone up by. So sales. Uh, okay, guess what? They're up twenty five percent increase in sales volume, um, increased by thirty one units to total one fifty five. That's right. Um, newly listed though. A uh, little scary here, uh, up 112.5%. Um, so we were 160 condos listed in the east side of Vancouver this time last year, and now we're at 340. Mm-hmm. Uh, inventory then up 20% over last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you are shopping for a condo in the Vancouver East area, you have about 560 to choose from. Yeah. Sales ratio is still operating inside of... Um, seller's market, which is, which is great. Um, but the year over year change is marginal at 1.2% higher, but still, um, not, um, the same level of change that we've seen in other asset classes, which is uh, a little troubling. So really across the board, we are obviously seeing the biggest increase in inventory in the condo market. Mm -hmm. And while we did see prices increase last month, it can only sustain that for so long if yeah. this inventory trend is going to continue. Yeah. Um, you know, we're in September now, and, and historically, um, even though we're kind of blown out all sorts of um, reminiscent, uh, I guess, listing curves, um, I do think that people are going to list pretty strongly this month. And should they do that, I don't think there's the buyer pool for the condo market yeah, to I absorb agree. it at, yeah. at a rate. So, um, yeah, I think it's pretty safe to predict that condo, condo prices will likely um, go flat and then potentially soften over the upcoming few months here yeah i you know i think we're at the we're at the start of that curve right so i mean um and it's just not what we're hearing you know like anecdotally what we're the people we talk to um the buyers we're speaking to uh, the the demand for condos is is just not what it was right now and i think that's also due in part to the fact that the borders are are not open right and those are the typical people that come in to vancouver get their foothold in a one-bedroom condo um, and then make their moves from there we're just not seeing that level of activity right now yeah, exactly. So we uh, also like to take a quick look at the pre-sale market because mm-hmm. the pre-sale market is, is always an interesting one. We feel that it is a, a bit of a, a lagging indicator of what's happening in resale. Yeah. Um, pre-sale market has been understandably soft um, 
most of the year, but especially since COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it is unquestionably showing signs of life. Yeah, it's right breathing now. again. And what we can at least first say is uh, last month, there were 506 units uh, approximately that were brought to market. Yeah. 26% of those sold. Wow, that's pretty good. It's it's good, especially because last month, if I remember correctly, it was more around 13% absorption wow. rate. So arguably double the purchasing that's happened. That's it. And of course, because of that, and because of the strengthening resale market, um, developers are feeling more confident mm -hmm. in bringing product to market, right? You gotta, we understand that, of course, a lot of developers have held back. Right. You know, you're not gonna release a big uh, new development in the middle of COVID, let's say April, May, June. But, you know, July, um, to give you some, uh, some firm examples of this, July, there's about six projects that came online, somewhere around 220 units. That more than doubled in August, unit-wise anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, so nine projects with about 500 units came online. But what's happening in September? Doubled again. That's it. Seven projects, but some big ones. There's over 1,100 units in the pre-sale market expected to come to market this month. So let me play devil's advocate for one sec here. If there's 1,100 brand new units coming to market here, mm -hmm. and we just talked about softening condo prices, is this going to further impact the softening of those prices with these brand new units coming on, or are they really in kind of just spread out all over the map here. Well, do keep in mind, yes, predominantly, I don't have an exact number, but I would suggest that probably upwards of 70% of these are condos, Yeah. but some of these are uh, a four to five year build. Right, so they're still out. Yeah, yeah. And, and not all these are, of course, in the downtown Vancouver yeah. East West core, right? Yeah, of course. Uh, we're seeing extremely strong numbers in uh, especially the Fraser Valley right now. Yeah. A little larger for the townhome market, yeah. but you know, if you take a, a condo and it's a, a larger tower going a little bit further out of the downtown core, there is demand there. And of course, it's going to be price point yeah. driven. Well, and they're also not dealing with the strata crisis like a lot of properties are in Vancouver. Anyhow, mm -hmm. that's for another conversation. Yeah. So um, fun thing that we've added, uh, we always like to talk about one notable property of the month. Yep. Um, this month, it's one of our own. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are, you know, happy to do a kind of bring the story to you guys because it's a pretty interesting one. Uh, yeah. We've touched on it historically on this podcast, so we'll probably rip through it a bit quicker here. Yeah. But uh, we, we had a, a nice listing, little single family home, three bed, three bath, 2,000 square foot on a 5,600 square foot lot in Port Moody, specifically the Heritage Mountain area. Yeah. And if this doesn't emphasize what we've been talking about, I'm not quite sure what will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, granted, we did do a lot of marketing before this hit the market. Yeah. But I think the biggest way to kind of sum this one up is the day it hit the market, mm -hmm. we made it very clear that we were holding offers. Yeah. For six days later, three agents came forward sight unseen with over ask offers. Yeah. That's incredible. I mean, that's, if that doesn't tell you where people's heads are at for demand yeah. on a product, I'm not sure what will, mm -hmm. you know, that's people literally coming through saying, Hey, we'll buy the house. I'm not quite sure what it looks like, yeah. but it's good enough for me. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, obviously the area has very light inventory. Yeah. Uh, this was priced well at a million 99 and, um, it's one of the smaller homes in the neighborhood. So, you know, it's surrounded by 1.3s, 1.4s yeah. accentuating the demand for something like that. Um, Classic story of not owning the most expensive house on the most expensive street. That's it. Right? This is where you get to to benefit from that. So, I mean, well, let's just talk about kind of how it ended then because um, the stats are fascinating. Yeah. I mean, like I said, we, we held offers. So, we did private showings only. No how, open houses. How many showings though? 46. <laughs> 46 showings over five days. Um, That's a lot of work. On offer day, yeah, yeah I lived there basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On, uh, on offer day, we ended up receiving 18 offers. That's um, Six of those were subject free. The home ended up selling for 104000 over the asking price. Yeah. And this speaks to a couple of things. One, um, understanding your price point. Two, trusting your realtor and their strategy to get you the most amount of money. And then also realizing and recognizing exactly what's happening in the marketplace. Yep. So final sale price, uh, 1203000 Again, that's up 104 from the $1,099,000 list and about 160000 higher than uh, that good old assessed price. Right. Which, hey, that's... 16.3% off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Don't trust the assessed to mm -hmm. equal market value ever. No. All right. So let's talk uh, briefly about some uh, interest rates and some money here. Yeah. Mortgages. It seems yet again, we're going to come here and talk about an even lower uh, interest rate achieved on a mortgage. Yeah. Um, 
That's funny. I, I, I literally just renewed my mortgage um, and I got something very similar to here. Oh, yeah? I, I just went from 2.43% down to 1.7. Wow. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just a good time to be doing that. You know, um, I don't know if you're going to get cheaper rates ever. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, interestingly, my, my father just um, refinanced as well. They got a 169 wow. fixed five year oh, on God. their primary residence. Wow. Well, it's better than me. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, oh, yeah, my point zero one. Come on. <laughs> um, something else to note, of course, is that um, the stress test has been reduced three times now. Mm. So qualifying has become slightly easier. Yeah. And rates are the lowest they have been in history. And is it any wonder that people are trying to buy more than they have before? Yeah. The, it, it's an undeniable fact that I guess the people, you know, it, or it's not an undeniable fact, it's undeniable attractive number for people to, to go after. Yeah, and, I, and by more, I don't mean like buying two, three, four properties here. I mean by buying more uh, more home, Yeah, right? it's, they're, not, they're, it's not easier yet. No, you, know, no. you know, I mean, I say yes, but the stress test has reduced, so it's technically a little bit easier there, yeah. but we still have some of the most stringent lending policies yeah. in the world. Yeah, it's not 100% financing here. No, 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 no. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, the number Again, they if you if you're looking for cheap money, mortgages are are the cheapest they've ever been. Yeah, and and I think that they're going to stay low for a little while too. And I that's that's the other thing is the government continues to try and stimulate the economy. We're going to see lower interest rates, right? So, um, you know, I went variable, but to each their own. The horizon seems to keep extending yeah. from you know when i say that i mean like the bank of canada's predictions yeah. right they used to say just a couple months ago yeah we plan to keep the rates this low at least till 2022 yeah i'm hearing rumblings now 2023 24 yeah right so we, you can expect potentially very low rates for, for the next time. three to four years yep it's you know if, if, if that's something you're thinking about doing it can feel rather safe in the sense of let's say taking a variable rate yeah and knowing that it will likely stay below what a fixed rate will be for the foreseeable future. Yeah, it's rare for the Bank of Canada to come out and make those kind of statements, right? So when they do, um, listen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> an and of course, sure. And, and it's very likely that uh, when rates do start to increase, it's going to be incremental and it's going to be methodical. Yeah. It's not going to be a, a sudden jump that will jolt no. the economy or, or, um, or homeowners. Okay, and if we uh, move on to uh, employment uh, numbers here, because this is very, very important, and some very, actually, some really interesting um, tidbits here. Yes, uh, in the month of August, almost a quarter million jobs were created in Canada or brought back. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, so that's uh, 1.4% month over month. Yep. Um, uh, what else here? Well, that brings us to within about uh, just over a million jobs less than the pre-COVID level. Interesting. That's how far down we are right now. Now, what about what about the type of job though? Because you know, um, you know, it's not like we're we're seeing a ton of servers come back to work here. This is exactly it, and it's a very important data. So thanks for bringing it up. But it is mostly full-time work. Yeah. That was brought back in August compared right. to the previous month uh, being July. That was largely driven by part-time work. Right. Interesting. So it's that, uh, hmm. so things like tourism, things like service industry still being hit pretty hard. Of course, but yeah. we are seeing good growth in accommodation, uh, food services, uh, educational services. Cause they're so. figuring out if you will, how to operate in the environment. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, okay. Very interesting. So when compared to last August too, uh, Canadian employment down about 5.3%. Hmm. So obviously we're record lows here, but... Um, but that 5.3%, important to understand, um, is a, uh, or, or let me rephrase that, are jobs that may or may not necessarily be impacting the real estate market. Yeah, one thing that we saw early on, or I mean, we're still seeing it, which is quite interesting, is the high net worth jobs were only hit by about 1% to 1.5%. Relatively incubated. And they're actually back. Yeah. All, all the high net worth jobs that were lost are back. We're actually above where we were pre-COVID levels. Interesting. So it's, you know, while we have these massive, you know, 10, 15% unemployment, um, it's only about 5% of the actual employment income was lost over this time. And that's, that's far more impactful yeah. on what's happening, you know, to the economy, hmm. right? Because if you've only lost about 5% of your income, you might still be able to, uh, you know, function as an economy. And what does that correlate in terms of CERB payments? Because we have something like 15% of Canadians taking CERB payments. 
Was it something like that? Uh, yeah, I think it was up to 16%, 16% at one point. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Anyhow, um, so we're starting to see the Canadian employment uh, market, if you will, um, show some signs of, of life. And, and certainly if you have uh, a, a job that is more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, maybe intellectually based, or if you've got something that you are not in the service industry with, where sure. you can put droplets on people, Yeah, <laughs> you're okay. Yeah. So overall Canadian employment grew for four months in a row, yeah. um, but it does look like the pace of growth is slowing. So we'll all be keeping a close eye on this. Mm. When it comes to employment, uh, one sector that has actually achieved a full V-shaped recovery is the retail sector. That's fascinating. Somewhat, yeah. It's, it's Well, let's take a look here. It's been led, of course, by clothing, uh, followed by, what do we have here, sporting goods, and... Um, what's the last one there? Oh, and furniture. <laughs> I had to look in there. Because what's happened here is, as we know, people aren't spending on things that they normally would at this time of year, right? right? Let's call it trips to Europe or whatnot. Yeah. So, so no plane tickets, you know, no, that's it. no yeah. flying first class or anything like that. Yeah, right? People are, are locked in their homes, yeah. right? They're eating food, but they're not doing too much else that they would be normally, right? They're not out spending money on uh, entertainment, for yeah. example, yeah. right? So that money that they have, well, they still have an itch to buy something apparently. So they've gone towards retail sector and buying themselves new clothes, sporting goods, and of course, improving their home, like, yeah. you know, with the furniture. Like, have you have you tried to go down to Home Depot and buy wood right now? It's I, almost impossible. You know what? So a couple, couple stories uh, that kind of reflect in this. One, I have a, a deal that we just did, um, actually completed today. Um, my client told me she bought a, uh, a king size bed um, and is four months away from receiving that bed, if you can believe that. That's number one. Number two, um, I'm a big cyclist, so seeing things like sporting um, goods actually, you know, helping to contribute to this recovery. Um, have you tried to buy a bike lately? Huh, there you go. Next <laughs> it's a world, worldwide shortage of bikes. Yeah. Right? And I think that'll be the case for a while. Mm-hmm. You know? It's, I'm not getting on a bus anytime soon. I'd rather take a bike. Yeah, you know what's kind of... Here's another shocking stat that people would not have expected through this whole uh, pandemic and recession. Um, Canadian record have just hit record savings rates. Yeah, that's this is a really interesting piece. You know, and of course, yes, this is largely driven by uh, the government handouts. But, um, you know, we're looking at a household saving rate. We were down at like 2 3%. Yeah. It's jumped up to like 24 Yeah. 24% savings rate. People suddenly have more money than they've had in years thanks to government handouts. So it'll be really interesting to see where that money ends up. You know, are are people going to be continuing to save that in the event that they're thinking another, you know, shutdown is coming? So they're going to be using that money on groceries? Or is that actually going to form, you know, some piece of larger savings like going into the marketplace where they're going to leverage it and try and, you know, then eventually buy a house or something to that effect, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's interesting. Um, because I don't think anyone predicted it going into savings. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> savings and clothing. That's where it's going right now. And bikes. Yeah. <laughs> so another big economic driver is uh, housing starts, mm-hmm. right? This is uh, going to continually to be a, a very interesting one to watch because right now there's no immigration. Mm-hmm. Who are we building these houses for, right? So what is going to happen? And of course, we're seeing these new units coming to market. So a lot of people clearly believe that uh, we're going to either get a vaccine and the borders are going to reopen up. Mm. And let's think here, is there going to be a pent up demand to come into Canada? Is there I, pent up immigration demand for this country? Are you a- are you, are you asking me that? Yeah. Because I think the answer is yes. Right. Um, I mean, <laughs> COVID has uh, uh, really emphasized... I guess the um, benefit of having a universal healthcare system. I think if you look down south and you look at the trouble that they've been going through, um, you know, being a victim of a uh, non-universal healthcare system is something that I think people are now going to change their life around. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think Van- or Vancouver, but Canada proper is going to see um, worldwide immigration levels increase once this is over. Because of those reasons, right? You know, not not to mention the fact that we have space, um, and and just we just don't have the turmoil, right? And I think that's a big part of it. So I, yeah, I think, you know, um, are we going to see you know uh, housing starts get absorbed very you know super quickly? I don't know. 
Um, it's going to really largely depend on whether that border opens up and, and when that vaccine can uh, come into into the market. Mm-hmm. So numbers wise, uh, Canadian housing starts 16% increase month over month. Uh, we're talking about 250,000 units almost Whoa. in July. That's a uh, lot. It is. It is. Um, those are started, FYI. Those aren't yeah. built coming to market, right? So, and these are honestly these are largely uh, in the prairies in Atlantic Canada. Yeah, our building right now. Um, whereas in BC, we're up only about nine percent month over month. Right. Uh, this is about forty two thousand units. Right. Um, compared to um, following the rise of about thirty eight thirty nine thousand in June. Mm-hmm. Um, multi segment, of course, right? These are condos, uh, multi family buildings that are coming up, and um, honestly, that number it brings us to a, like pre COVID levels. Mm. We're building back to that level again. So builders or developers, anyhow, um, they must be seeing that there's more than just pent up demand here. They must be seeing, you know, if you're if you're a big developer in, in Vancouver, chances are you build all around the world too. Mm-hmm. And so you're you're seeing a story somewhere else. Right? Yeah, well, it's interesting because BC obviously is somewhat independent of, of Vancouver, yeah. um, which you know Vancouver was four percent month over month, right. so under the BC average of nine. Right. Um, Interestingly, though, uh, compared to July of last year, housing starts were down 23% in Vancouver. Interesting. So people are obviously looking outside of it. Yeah. Again, places like the Fraser Valley uh, are seeing an increase in demand overall as well, right? So people are building there. I would also say the Okanagan. And the island. Yeah. Definitely. We're, we're seeing a lot of uh, people don't have to be here. They're going to go somewhere where they really want to be, mm-hmm. right? And uh, vacation homes are another whole other topic to, to probably have a podcast on. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Okay, next up, we'll touch a little bit here on uh, the Canadian real GDP. Uh, the Q2 numbers are out, and we can dig in a bit to this. Um, obviously, it's taken a huge hit. You know, we are at record lows here, mm-hmm. um, contracting by, I think, something like 11.5% Ugh. in the second quarter, um, or, or like 39% on a quarterly analyzed basis, right? This is These are the biggest drops since, since 60s, yeah. since 61, I believe. Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, while it has begun uh, a bit of a V-shape recovery, it's just the early days here. And, uh, you know, we're not expected to see GDP return anywhere to normality until at least 2022. Yeah. It's going to be a, it's going to be a, a recovery. It's going to take some time. Yeah. Right. So, um, and whether or not that maintains a V-shape, you know, I, I don't, I don't think so, but mm-hmm. we'll see. Right. So again, current uh, near zero Bank of Canada policy rates, historically low, five-year fixed. They're yeah. going to be around for a while. Yeah. This is what this is telling us. Yep. That's right. That's where we're getting these predictions for two, three years, right? So You bet. So that kind of wraps up uh, what's happened last month. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we usually like to end these with a bit of a forecast as best as we can, uh, looking out two, three months yep. into the future here. Yeah. Probably not any further than 60 days right now. Mm-hmm. Um, depending on what news source you're listening to, COVID is apparently coming back and it's going to be worse than it ever was. Um, but that being said, um, I think the balance of September and certainly I think October are going to be very busy months. I just, I think, I think especially in the duplex townhome and single family markets, yep. I just think it's going to be red hot for those two months. Um, whether or not it spills over into November. The thing the thing is with November is we have a huge U.S. election. And I think a lot of attention because it just of who it is. And I just think that there's going to be, oh, I think there's just going to be um, a tremendous amount of uh, attention given to that. And I think you're going to actually see it in marketplaces come out. Right, right? yeah. Um, you know, uh, that being said, um, CERB payments are continuing for the, for the short run, anyhow. Um, so Canadian government's still trying to help people there. Um, and then, and then, yeah, are, are Canadians going to use some of the, uh, the their new savings and, and apply it in the marketplace in the next couple of months? We'll see. Mm-hmm. Sales-wise, unquestionably, you know, September is already off to a very strong start. Uh, we're at 800 plus units already for the oh, month. Cow. Uh, I will not be surprised if we hit a five to, to seven year high in sales volume for the month of September. Yeah. So, but we're also going to see that similar spike in listings. Yeah. You know, I think we're going to see August kind of accentuate through the month of September here. Yeah. Um, October, probably pretty similar, mm-hmm. right? The appetite is very interesting right now. Um, things may start to cool off come November. 
Um, I think we're going to continue to see detached and townhome prices increase, like you mentioned. Yeah. I think we're going to see condo prices flatline over the next two to three months. Yeah, I think we should probably talk touch on looking ahead with condos. Just it's it's not necessarily. I, I don't know if it's great news. Um, I don't think you're going to lose a ton of money, but I do think that people just in terms of um, if you're looking, if you're trying to buy a condo, holy, I think maybe in in two or three months is is really going to be a good time. You know, uh, I think you, you might get that COVID deal. Mm-hmm. Um, there's going to be a few buyers out there that may have already purchased uh, a bigger home and are looking to move their units. Right. So uh, the longer they stay on, the more they've got to compete with, the better the deal the buyer might get. Right. So um, if you are considering that, um, maybe just hold on a little bit. All very true. Uh, oh, definitely something else we should touch on, too. Um, the CMHC phrased mortgage deferral mm-hmm. cliff. Ah, yes. I have learned that they are fear mongers and they love to, you know, make <laughs> big predictions and, yeah. and, and create such terms. Uh, a lot of the big banks, the lenders, they are going to end deferrals at the end of this month, September. Right. Uh, it looks like they will not be extending for a lot of people as well. Mm-hmm. I do think there will be some case by case stories. Yep. If you go to the bank, if you are truly in trouble, if you really do need help, go and talk to that person who might be able to extend it. But I think as an overall, go online and click two buttons and you're extended. Yeah. I don't think those, you know, they've, they've said those aren't going to exist. Yeah. And I mean, if you look at the fact that, you know, vast majority of Canadians took their serve payments and stuffed it in their mattress then, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. the, that deferral has to stop at some point. And we're, yeah, we're also going to f- up find out how many of these deferrals were actually needed. Yeah. Uh, and maybe they were, but uh, how many are still needed, yeah. right? How many people are actually going to go into arrears in the next few months here? Mm-hmm. Um, we don't know yet. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting stat. I don't know if anybody knows, but uh, it's something we're going to pay close attention to. And we're going to start to see this data come out uh, probably by the end of, October. And I think we're also going to have, um, just for our listeners, uh, a whole podcast on this deferral cliff and whether or not it's something that we should be, you know, uh, totally concerned about or, or whether or not it's, uh, again, another uh, fear mongering story that, um, you know, we're told to, to watch out for. Yeah. We work with a couple of uh, mortgage advisors and brokers and uh, yeah we're going to interview a few of them here and get a couple of insights to help share with you yeah i think that's it uh at least for the market update here um one thing that I do want to say is that, uh, you know, if you if you do like it and you want to uh, you want to explore it further, um, you know, feel free to reach out to both Dan and I um, for a free consult. We're happy to do that. Sit down with you, talk about your property, your next five years. Um, that's why we do this, right? Yeah, this is all very top level stuff, and it's very safe to say that properties and neighborhoods and block to blocks they all act very independent of one another. Yeah. So if you are very curious about uh, what's right for you, and what your property might be worth, we're very happy to take a very you know uh, super focused look on yours and, and give you a true value cool all right on well that's everything for this episode guys thanks very much again for listening and uh we'll hit you next week